Well, let's move to panel three. Um, the name of this panel is Shaping the Path Forward from Disruption to Transformation. And our final session is going to be moderated by Mariette Di Cristina, the Dean of the College of, Admin of Communication at Boston University and a nationally recognized science journalist. Previously, she was editor-in-chief at Scientific American and the first woman to head Scientific American since its founding in 1845. There, she led the editorial team to receive the coveted National Magazine Award for General Excellence. Please join me in welcoming Mariette DiCristina and the panel three panelists. I want to thank you for that truly lovely introduction. I was sitting here thinking, since we're using the terms of social media now, that I was having a squee moment uh, with all the wonderful expertise and insights in this room. So it's uh, my real pleasure to introduce a wonderful panel of, of experts to conclude this part of the series of our discussions today. I'm going to share their names super briefly, and then as we've been doing with the other panels, I'll introduce them with a little bit more. Uh, so to my far right, your far left, is Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia, welcome. Um, and Dr. Leslie Vauxhall, lovely to see you. Um, Dr. Keith Yamamoto and uh, Elena Weibach. Nice to see you today and thank you so much. So, um, so, you know, I think I was reflecting on the lessons we've been getting today and quite a number of them um, are sort of reflect and refract off each other and I hope we'll continue to build on that as this third panel gets a chance to reflect on the rest of the day so far. We've heard about disrupting challenges in the scientific enterprise, including diversity in multiple ways in research, science communication, recruiting and retaining folks, and um, you know, developing different ways of uh, thinking about science. We've heard about changing the game, emergent science and technology areas, and our third panel will continue the forward-looking perspective and will highlight how we address those challenges going forward as we move toward transformation. And I, I might impose a little bit on our panelists uh, after we hear their remarks for how do we get those first steps in place because it occurs to me that largely we've been talking at a very high level, uh, but you know, and that's important. Uh, in the last, uh, we just heard a commenter say, it's good to, to have a short-term and longer-term gain. We do need to do that at all times thinking shorter and longer. And a bit later, we'll have a conversation and again, we'll turn to questions and answers and the uh, questions in the room. The questions are for the audience to ask. The answers come from the speakers and um, I really appreciate your asking those questions with a little up sound at the end, as Alan Leshner used to say. So first, let me uh, please turn to uh, Dr. Sangeeta Bhatia, who is John and Dorothy Wilson, Professor of Health Sciences and Technology and of Electrical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Over to you. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to see you. So I think as, um, as physicians, many of us uh, learn by case study. Uh, so I thought I'd give you a case study today of an example of convergence science. Uh, so convergence being the intersection of life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. Um, I myself am a physician and an engineer by training. Um, and so the case study I'd like to give you is one in nanomedicine. Um, so just to kind of orient you, uh, nanotechnology is kind of the world under 100 nanometers. Um, and it's a set of technologies that have emerged um, at the nanoscale. So human hair is 100 microns. These are 1,000 times smaller. And we really have two different sets of technologies that have emerged um, in nanotechnology. On the left, you see a semiconductor microchip. So the kind that's in your smartphone, the one that's in your, most of your smartphones has 8 billion transistors with 5 nanometer features. Um, we call this top-down fabrication, the ability to pattern materials with light at that resolution. On the right of your screen, you see another set of technologies that have emerged really from the world of chemistry and material science. And here we make ensembles of molecules and atoms to make nanoscale materials like gold and lipid materials and carbon nanotubes. And what's amazing about these materials at this scale is they have actually distinct properties than their macroscopic counterparts. They're different colors, they have different electronic properties, magnetic properties, and even biological trafficking properties. 
So this is an amazing toolkit to sort of spur medical innovation. And in our country, um, a large emphasis um, on the intersection of nanotechnology and medicine has come from longstanding investments that the NIH made through the National Cancer Institute on spurring cancer um, advances. And what was amazing about that is that when COVID came along, you may or may not recognize that nanotechnology was actually one of the unsung heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the surveillance that we did for viral variants was nanotechnology enabled, point of care diagnostics, the color change on that paper strip was nanotechnology enabled. And of course, we've been talking about mRNA vaccines, which are packaged in lipid nanoparticles, which had already been worked out to be manufactured at scale with their four component parts. So in fact, these long-standing investments in cancer nanomedicine actually enabled um, our our country and the world to pivot so quickly to be able to address an urgent crisis. Um, and what that looked like over time is these individual threads of research really starting for their own goals. So miniaturization, really the goal there has been to speed computation. And nucleic acid therapeutics had their own goals. And if you sort of layer onto that stem cell research, cancer biology, genomics, and the emergence of artificial intelligence, What's really very exciting is that these are converging. They are coming together in the last decade to address really, we hope, grand challenges in many fields. In cancer, we've been focused on early detection, enabling immunotherapy, addressing metastatic disease, and cancer diagnosis and treatment in resource-poor settings. But as I hope you've seen, like these long-standing investments actually can enable uh, pivoting for, for new opportunities and challenges as they emerge. So in sort of case study format, I wanted to get really specific about what does convergence research look like? It's not just a colorful diagram on the slide. What does it look like on the ground? And I thought I'd give you an example of my little microenvironment um, where I do research. So I sit in the middle of Cambridge. Uh, in a building. It's an NCI designated cancer institute. It's called the Koch Institute for Integrated Cancer Research. And it was built um, when Susan Hockfield was our president and the inaugural director was Tyler Jacks. And every floor of the building is half cancer biologists and half engineers that I'll call cancer curious. And there are six such floors in the building and we're all focused on grand challenges in cancer. There are 700 researchers in the building, but that is actually too big of a community with which to have deep, long-form conversations and safe innovation. And so the way that plays out is we have micro-communities, even within this structure. What I show you there is the six individual engineers who are in the Cancer Nanomedicine Center that we have within this building. And there are many such micro-communities in our building. And then we physically sit in a larger ecosystem, which is really important for enabling and accelerating the uh, delivery of discoveries from the bench to the bedside. And that has to do with adjacent institutes, so the Broad Institute, the Schwarzman College of Computing, and then also local industry, biotech startups, pharmaceutical companies, and importantly, investors. Now, the impact of this kind of community can be measured in many ways in discoveries, in publications, in trainees, in medicines. Um, but just one metric that I'd like to show you is a little bit um, at least jarring to me and fa fascinating is um, over the last uh, 15 or so years, 100 companies have come out of this particular building. Um, so this format of innovation and convergence, I think, is really very ripe to be uh, replicated in many places around the country. And of course, there are other such uh, centers focused on other diseases. Um, and I hope you leave this, um, this panel today thinking about a future of convergent science and what it can do um, for some of the problems that you're focused on. And I'm happy to talk about some of the enablers um, as we go. I'd like to welcome Dr. Leslie B. Bosshall, who's Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and Robin Chambers, Newstein Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Neurogenetics and Behavior at the Rockefeller University. Thank you. So I want to bring this back to a question that was posed earlier this morning by Neil Hanshard, which is, who is doing the science? 
So earlier today, we elected new members at the National Academy of Sciences. 50% of them are women, right? So who is doing the science outside of the National Academy of Medicine? It's not 50% women. As we heard a few minutes ago, just under 3% of black Americans receive R01s. There's a huge disconnect between the demographics of the United States and the people who are actually doing the science. This has been discussed endlessly for decades. We've been wringing our hands for decades to try to figure out why is this. And so part of the panel's idea was to bring some transformational ideas to figure out how we can address it. There's no easy fix. Um, many of us have been thinking about it. And so I want to give you the case study of your 30-year-old postdoc. You have a two-year-old that needs to go to daycare. Um, you've just started on an NIH-funded postdoctoral fellowship, and your salary is $54,835, right? You don't have health insurance. You don't have retirement contributions. So you're 30 years old, you're an adult, and you're trying to live on $54,000. You may be historically underrepresented in science and going into a laboratory where the, you're the only person in your demographic and you're encountering a hostile environment. And so I think none of us should be wondering, why are we not getting postdoc applications? Why are our postdocs leaving to go to private sector positions? And I would say, on the one hand, we need to pay postdocs a living wage, and I think that this is coming for all of us. I think postdocs are unionizing rapidly. So I think we have to have some conversation very quickly that is not acceptable to pay somebody with an advanced degree $54,000. There has to be some mechanism within our profession to pay people according to their credentials. So that's the first thing. I also think that we owe it to our trustees to have an environment that is more welcoming. And so this is where it comes down to my new job at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute that our vision for where we get to 50% women in science and African-American and Hispanic scientists proportional with where they are is to make happy and inclusive, equitable labs. Sounds kind of hokey, sounds kind of Girl Scouty. I was a Girl Scout. Um, <laughs> but the idea is the way that we've been making these investments is with the Hannah Gray Fellows Program, which gives um, postdocs four years of support, and we explicitly recruit them because they are underrepresented in science. So they're women of racial and ethnic um, representation, underrepresented in science. We give them eight years of support, right? So they're selected, they're given eight years of stable funding. When they set up their labs and they're very aggressively recruited because we have a huge diversity problem, they then recruit women and minorities to their labs because you want to be part of a group that is diverse. And as has been said many times today, diverse people do diverse science. We're launching another program which kind of turns up the temperature a little bit more. So the Freeman Rabowski Scholars Program, named in honor of the great Freeman Rabowski, who has figured out how to educate and graduate and populate the world with incredible black scientists, engineers, and physicians. And so then we're giving these folks 10 years of support. And the way you become a Freeman Rabowski scholar is that you care about your people, you care about a diverse lab, you make a, make a welcoming environment, you pay them a living wage. And so we think that if by selecting 30 of these scholars this year, and then over the next 10 years, 150 scholars, they each have on average 20 people in their lab, um, and they're getting professional development to be able to encourage people to have a happy lab, that we're gonna have some generative ability to bring um, people into science that represent um, the demographics um, of the country. And so that, I'm just gonna stop there. So the answers are pay people a living wage, get people, get lab heads the help that they need to recruit diverse people and make the labs happy that we currently have this generational shift. Those of you who have labs, millennials and Gen Z, they're not like us, right? They're just not like us. They expect more. They expect more from the environment. And I don't think that we have really confronted this, that we need to adapt how we interact with our trainees to meet them where they are. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to our fearless leader. Our third speaker is Dr. Keith Yamamoto, who is Vice Chancellor for Science Policy and Strategy, University of California at San Francisco, 
UCSF Precision Medicine and Professor Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at UCSF. Great. Isn't it great they're not like us? <laughs> <laughs> what a relief. Um, so our marching orders, as Leslie said, on this panel was to bring forward um, uh, policies that could drive transformation um, in our current enterprise and environment. Uh, now, uh, like the other speakers, I have six minutes, so that should be no problem in standing <laughs> up with, say, three transformative changes um, and discussing them. So let's, let's try it. Um, uh, I'm going to raise them in the context of science and technology writ large um, rather than traditional uh, uh, biomedical sciences, just to underscore what we've already heard from Sangeeta um, uh, and from Carl Dyseroth in the last panel about the uh, importance and power of transdisciplinary uh, science. So here we go, number one of three. Uh, focus federal science and technology efforts on existential societal threats. The government should be launching um, multi-agency, multi-sector science and technology initiatives that address major societal challenges. Together with Mary Woolley, who's here, uh, um, and Sudip Parikh and Bill, Novell, no, Bill Novelli, I have the honor of co-chairing the Science and Technology Action Committee, which is an ad hoc collective of two dozen leaders across academia, industry, uh, the nonprofit uh, uh, sector, uh, and government. Um, uh, it actually includes Marsha McNutt, Victor Zhao, um, and Harvey Feinberg, so the presidencies of the academies well re represented. Uh, in 2020, that group stood up four such societal challenge areas, uh, all of which you will recognize directly impact health, so public health and health care, of course, but environment and climate change, uh, energy uh, uh, production, utilization, and storage, and food and water security big issues that need science and technology to be in transformative ways to be able to move forward. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a call to um, abandon basic science. Uh, for all four of those challenges, ongoing knowledge discovery is going to be continuously the feedstock of, of uh, uh, ideas for development of impactful applications. So, continued steady funding increases in support of basic science, agree with everything that we heard from Ali Shalatiford this morning, um, but now linked to abundant new funding for challenge-specific, coordinated, multi-agency, multi-sector initiatives. Number two, award high levels of public funds, public funds for science and technology to the private sector, to companies. Wow. The U.S. Science, and Policy, the US science Policy Framework as you all know, was really set in 1945 by Vannevar Bush in, in the Endless Frontiers uh, report uh, that he wrote for President Roosevelt. The federal government, he said, should support basic research and the, fun, and the uh, training of the next generation of scientists in our universities and medical schools. And after that, the private sector would take over, driven by the profit motive, to take those basic discoveries and turn them into things, products, drugs, and so forth. Well, that handoff doesn't actually work, or at least it works too slowly, um, we, uh, as, as seen by the decades-long, three decades-long gap between fundamental discovery and, and the final approval of, by the FDA of a new drug as really documented in a beautiful paper by Mark Fishman in 2018. So one can imagine three broad conditions where companies would be, be bestowed taxpayer, do, taxpayer dollars at scale. This is, we're talking about a lot of money here. First, de-risking, that is, um, resources to uh, create important new technologies that are burdened by substantial uncertainty by long development timelines, by perceptions of small markets. These are, these are issues that, that uh, the risk-averse quarterly report conscious industries really can't take on. Second, public need, as in uh, novel antimicrobials, uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, climate change mitigation, uh, things of that sort. And third, economic and national security. 
hear passage, recent passage of the Chips and Science Act indicates that there's some uh, consciousness in response to that third notion. Number three, uh, ensure that science and technology benefits all. Complex social justice and equity issues are embedded in all emerging technologies, but these issues have, been, have not been considered strongly by many of the stakeholders in the technology life cycle. This is not a new problem. Many of you know of the inequities in COVID-19 triage and therapy decisions suffered by people of color due to systematic measurement errors by a 40-year-old technology, pulse oximetry. And the inequities continue to emerge in the development and use of new technologies introduced at every stage along the technology life cycle. These inequities selectively disadvantage specific racial and ethnic groups, gender and LBGTQ uh, groups, or those that are disabled in poverty or living in rural locations. It's heartening that President Biden issued an executive order on his first day in office promoting government-wide attention to equity. In general, however, science and technology enterprises need a system that encourages funders, developers, regulators, and other stakeholders in both the public and private sector that prioritizes equity. In hopes of addressing that, the National Academy of Medicine has stood up a consensus report committee, which I'm honored to co-chair with, uh, uh, with Kate, Keith Weilu, that's been charged with developing a federally coordinated, multi-agency, multi-sector governance framework founded on core ethical principles with a focus on equity, extending from conception to post-market for emerging science and technology uh, in health and medicine. So, lots to be done to revolutionize our enterprise. These are just three ideas. Focus on societal uh, challenges. Put public funds um, for science and technology at scale into the private sector. And elevate equity to ensure that science and technology benefits all. Well done getting that all into six minutes. Uh, now I'm um, delighted to turn to Elena Weibach, because, Elena, excuse me, because we have talked about a lot of the elements of commercialization, but we haven't really talked about, uh, you know, how that, how that happens from the company perspective. So uh, from General Catalyst, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Elena Weibach, and I'm so honored to be here at the National Academy of Medicine, um, where it all starts, where it all happens. And... I thought of some things to talk about, but before I go into what I planned, I just want to recognize Leslie's point, which is so, so important. So I'm a part of an investing partnership and we invest in science and technology and 40% of our partnership and leadership team identifies as not white. We're not nearly as far along with women. Um, we're working on it. I'm trying to recruit and we have a truly happy and friendly environment. I joined a year ago, the firm is 20 years old, and it is unbelievable how welcoming it is and what a difference that makes in the environment. Um, so just wanted to pick up on that and how important it is. Okay, so what did I actually plan to talk about? Um, I'm going to give a bit of background about General Catalyst, talk about our investing philosophy around responsible innovation, and talk about investing in life sciences, which is what I spend most of my time doing. Um, so the National Academy of, Sci of Medicine's um, mission speaks to advancing science, accelerating health equity, and building a healthier future for everyone. And General Catalyst has a lot of overlap with that mission. So as a venture fund, we focus on investing in powerful, positive change that endures. And from the inception, we've been strongest at early stage investing. That's the core of what we do. And responsible innovation is our unique angle of how we do it. I'd encourage everyone to check out Responsible Innovation Labs, of which we're a founding member. And I won't spend time talking through the seven pillars, but inclusive prosperity is one of them. So when we look at how we invest, we think about enduring companies. Those are companies that have society's permission to keep existing. And so if we start working with a company, we ask, what impact will this have at scale? And we help design companies for both growth and good. And this isn't philanthropy. This is a business imperative because we think these are the only companies that society will allow to exist. Uh, we have a three-pronged thesis in healthcare particularly. 
So we focus on investing in companies that can transform the healthcare system from a sick care system to a healthcare system. That's the first. The second is bending the cost curve. And the third is expanding health access and equity. So that hits on a lot of the themes that have come up earlier today. We also want to invest in companies that transform the healthcare system. You know, the title of the panel includes the word disruption. We actively avoid that. We want to work with the health system to deliver better care that's more accessible to people. And one of the ways we do that is by working with health system leaders. So Mark Harrison, former CEO, or current CEO, soon to be former of Intermountain Health. Um, we work with Ron Paulus, who's the former CEO of Mission Health, Steve Clasco from Jefferson. And some of our investments, I hope, will also resonate with this. So Livongo was created in General Catalyst's office. And it was really formed out of a premise that started in academic medicine, which was population health. And at the time, people didn't think it would translate, especially not into a profit imperative, because in our fee-for-service medical system, doing things that help diabetic patients take better care of themselves, very unclear whether there's any fee-for-service value in that. It's more interactions with the healthcare system, drives more costs, so you might think. So what Livongo did is prove through clinical studies that this concept could be implemented in the real world, showing a 22% reduction in cost for diabetic patients and a one-year ROI. And they actually got it adopted. Lavanga went public, was eventually acquired for $18.5 billion by Teladoc, proving that there is a real commercial value in doing what's best for patients and embedding the cost curve. I want to switch a little bit. I had more examples, but I didn't budget time well. Um, so I want to switch a little bit to what I spend most of my time doing, which is investing in life sciences. So the vast majority of what we do in life sciences builds on work that is done in academia, that is led by people who are trained in academia. I've never met a college dropout biotech startup that succeeded. Don't quote me on this, but, you know, um, generally people who have the best impact tend to have extensive academic training. And so what I do really relies on people like you. And I invest across therapeutics, diagnostics, and research tools. And some of the key themes we're pursuing are investing at the intersection of compute and biology, which I'm sure this group knows well, harnessing nature's machinery, investing in research tools, and clinical trial technology and infrastructure. And on the clinical trial side, that really ties to some of the earlier panel's conversations. So a couple of our investments that you'll hear about in the press soon, they haven't announced yet, are focused on clinical trial technology infrastructure that expand clinical research as a care option. So how can you give people the opportunity, not the obligation, to access clinical research? Another investment that we did in the theme of computationally enabled drug discovery is we recently led the Series B financing of Odyssey Therapeutics. Gary Glick started out in academia for many years. He is a chemist, and his team has developed a novel chemistry platform that they're using to develop drugs for cancer and autoimmune disease, and they have eight programs underway. Maybe the last example I'll give is really at the intersection of academia and investing we just led the seed financing of Control Therapeutics, and it was founded by Dr. Shana Kelly. This is her fourth company, and she is in academia, leading a lab, and finds the time to work so deeply with companies, translating her discoveries um, you know, around her technology, which can identify circulating tumor reactive lymphocytes. So I know I'm over time, I'll wrap up. Uh, we need you, we need academic discoveries to fuel our investing. And we need clinicians to help us understand where the true unmet medical needs that drive what we're trying to do. So thank you.